Welcome to Transform Now, the podcast brought to you by robotic process automation pioneer, Blue Prism. Digital transformation has the potential to reshape the way companies service their customers, engage their employees, and manage their operations. Whether you're looking to develop strategies, tactics, and best practices to positively impact the future of work, or you're curious to learn how other companies have successfully navigated their digital transformation programs, then this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform now. Hello, everyone. I'm Brad Hairston with Blue Prism. Welcome to the Transform Now podcast. Today, I'm happy to have as my guest, Jeff Galino, CTO and founder of CallMiner, a leading conversation analytics platform and a Blue Prism partner, as well as Satish Shinoy, RVP of Strategic Technology Alliances and Partnerships at Blue Prism. I will be talking with Jeff and Satish about how deriving intelligence from customer interactions is transforming customer experience. Jeff and Satish, thank you so much for joining me today. That's great to be here. Thanks for having us, uh, Brent. You bet. So let's start with some introductions. Jeff, we'll let you go first. Yeah, great. Thank you. I've been in this industry since I was, I think, 15 and selling timeshares over the phone and being paid cash out the door. So <laughs> pretty reputable. I, I took 11 years and joined the U.S. Air Force and finished there at the Pentagon, which was interesting. And it exposed me to the concept of data is super, super, super important. And so after the military did consulting for a while, earned the medium dollars. And then in 2002, wrote a business plan for call miner and hung out the shingle and 19 and a half years later, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Satish. Thank you, Brad. Uh, Satish Shanoi. I'm the regional VP of uh, technology alliances at Blue Prism. I've been here about almost coming up three years. It's been a exciting ride for many reasons. I've spent a lot of time in the contact center space. I spent about 16 years at Avaya and then did my time with a couple of startups uh, in the Bay Area. I've worked across continents, across countries, many, many places across the U.S. When it comes to contact center, that's what, one of my passions. While I lead the technology alliances at Blue Prism, contact center has been my favorite part of the that bias, if you will, towards partners like Paul Miner. And so I'm really excited to be here and participate in this podcast. Thank you. Excellent. And you left, you left out the most important part, Satish, that you're a new Texan. You've migrated to the great state of Texas. Yes. I can't believe you didn't mention that. Oh, I should have said that. The great nation. Let me remind you. Thank you. The great nation of Texas. Okay. So keep, the locals keep reminding me that it is I think, a great nation. I think we just lost Jeff. Jeff, are you still on the <laughs> podcast? Okay. Yeah. He's still there. He's still there. So gentlemen, as we continue our three-part podcast series on automating the contact center, Today, we're turning our attention toward the importance of understanding the end customer more effectively so that we can help them have the best possible experience across all communication channels. Technology is certainly paving the way toward doing this in a more innovative way with AI and machine learning thrown into the mix. And so that brings us to Call Miner, who Blue Prism has added to our Technology Alliance Partnership Program. So Jeff, for those listeners who are not familiar with Call Miner, can you please tell us a bit more about your company? Sure. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Call Miner has been originally in the speech analytics market, which we called call mining in our day. <laughs> Sorry. For, like I said, about 19 and a half years, really helped create the category. Any of the companies that existed when we started have long since either been acquired or gone out of business, that sort of thing. So we feel kind of like the, uh, the old, the, the, the old wizened business group here, but the reality is that it's coming more into the fore, probably in the past four or five years where it's gone from just a pure luxury item to something that's a little bit more required, demanded, that sort of thing. So what is call miner? What do we do to make it very simple? We started in voice, but we now do Omni. So any communication, any interaction between a customer an enterprise and their end customers. We're interested in understanding 
the context behind those communications mm -hmm. so that we can do things like trigger digital workers so that we can do things like provide scoring to help improve agent performance so that we can help people close sales more quickly, help with patient experiences, product and branding experiences. All of those can be very, I believe, very well measured. The big difference is our approach. I think when we first started, this approach was very differentiating. And, and I think we just kind of continue here is that we mine every word said and how it's said, and then put it in the database and go at it. So we can do hmm. at the call or contact level all the way to what happened in this center in the past week. Why did we have that spike? It, it, it's really meant to be an informational intelligence tool that gets its data from conversation, spoken word, typed word, that sort of thing. A lot of people I think are view the whole conversational intelligence space as just sentiment plus a little bit more, but I'll be honest with you, um, in something as complex as a call sentiments, interesting in the moment you say it, it is not interesting over the course of a phone call. It's just, there's too many changes. It, everything comes out neutral. It's, it's not very helpful, right? It's not about, was this a good or positive 25 word review? A typical conversation is five, six, seven minutes, thousand words. We collect 10,000 pieces of data. And we do that in both the real time domain, as it's being said, as well as the, the post-call domain. And I'll, I'll leave you with a fun fact. Outside of the U.S. government, we believe we process more audio than anybody on the planet for speech recognition purposes. That includes <laughs> Microsoft, Google, and Amazon in their speech processing products, looking at their numbers. We're on a path to be at a million hours. I'll say that again, a million hours a day processed. <laughs> probably by the end of 22. So wow. we do quite a bit now, but that number is constantly in, in flux. That includes digital and a bunch of other things. Mm. But we'll get into some of that with the questions and answers. I'm <laughs> yeah, that is a fun fact. Thank you for sharing that. Very interesting. So how does Call Miner work? I mean, can you expand on this and, and also sure. talk about where AI and machine learning play a role in your platform? You know, it's, it's interesting. I think we've been using AI machine learning for more than a decade, but we just didn't call it that because nobody called it that. And everybody didn't want to sound oddly antiquated. When you mention AI 10 years ago, people would laugh at you. I would, I'd be like, come on, man, we did AI in the eighties, <laughs> but you know, it's everything old is new again. Mm -hmm. And so to, to very succinctly answer your question. What we do is we take the conversation and we get it into a, if you will, a readable format, a transcript. If it's a call, we run it through uh, one of many different kinds of transcription engines. It's one of the things we can do. You bring your own transcription engine. We don't care. But if it's in another text format, we basically put them all in a similar format and then we start enriching them layer by layer. So the first thing you do is you say, I have 1100 words in this call. That's too many. I, if I wrote all that down, it would look silly. So tell me the best thing that happened. Yeah, doesn't really work that way, but I'll tell you the 20 to 50 topics of conversation. Oh, wow. So you can tell me, yeah, you had a good greeting and branding and opening. Here were the procedures you talked about. Here's how you authenticate it. Here was the first sale attempt and the rebuttal and the, uh, and the no, and then here's how you got to yes. And then we went through the process of whatever, you know, actually paying for it and then exiting. And that might be a simple sales call. Mm -hmm. You think about a patient experience call where you have diagnosis and, and even small talk bedside manner stuff, where you review medications and pharmaceuticals, jump into heck of the world of just help desk. Hi, mm -hmm. I, I just got this new device and I, I don't know how to send this thing to my mother. Oh, let me walk you through that. Oh, okay. Well, it, appears that you didn't pay for the ability to send things would you like to buy and you get the idea right. so turning it into those 20 to 50 topics is a really good start and honestly most of our use cases spin off of that simple idea mm -hmm. but then there's people who need richer data and they need summarizable operational data and so if i know these things did or didn't happen during a call i can create a mathematical score out of that mm -hmm. i can say that's a five on a scale of one to ten 
for experience, but the agent did a really great job, even if the customer was unhappy and they'd get a nine out of 10, but there's a risk that this customer is going to churn and we're going to call that the churn score. And that you get a, a 62 out of 125. Yeah. Doesn't matter to us, their scores. And then they can be aggregate. Oh, we took 50 calls from this agent today and their average score was a 92, but the area that they continuously need improvement is X. So maybe it's empathy. Maybe it's something like understanding this procedure or going to this much base correctly. Okay. So when you think about what our platform does, it provides all of these enrichment services for conversation. And this is where a lot of people get hung up. They think, oh, well, what do I need that? I need a transcript and some NLP and I'm good to go. And the reality is most NLP doesn't work against spoken conversation because we don't speak the way we write. We don't punctuate. And there's things that can add that later, but they're adding it with the same kind of modeling that the NLP is added from it. So it doesn't really add a lot of richness to the data. And in fact, when we started this, 19 years ago, speech recognition was hot garbage. And I say that with all love and respect, right? A good transcript was 50% accurate. Think about that for 50%. But if you're seeing 50,000 transcripts a day, and that represents, let's say, I don't know, 500 hours of conversation, 1,000 hours of conversation, mm -hmm. that means I have 500 hours of valid statements. And, and the errors are predictable because it came from a prediction engine. So it's predictable how it gets it wrong. And so you can still blend all that. And with a high degree of accuracy, I'm talking in the 80s and 90s, say, this is what they talked about, and here's how we did. So roll all that together, that's what the platform's about. And then it becomes a scaling, management, integration, API-led, all the other things that once you get into the enterprise space, you realize, oh, I can't just take a transcript and throw some NLP at it. As easy as that sounds, I'm not going to do that 150,000 times a day for seven years of back data, which is what people want. So that's what we do in a nutshell. And I apologize it, it, when I say it out loud, I'm like, that's a lot of stuff, but that's the reality of any enterprise platform. I'm sure in Blue Prism, uh, you don't even use the word bot because it's not bots, right? <laughs> <laughs> digital workers on a platform with shared services. And so all of those same, same kind of things apply. Mm -hmm. Speech recognition is one of the deepest examples of machine learned behavior. Yep. And a lot of what we do stems from those same kinds of learning models, what we call uh, CLP, conversational language programming and practices. There's just, it's all the way through it. I mean, to saying, hey, this person's likely to churn, that could be the result of a prediction done through mm -hmm. a model. It could be the result of just a simple score, which by the way, is still a modeling process, mm -hmm. uh, but more than likely it's a combination of those and many external factors all brought into those models. So it's not traditional chatbot as people think of AI, right. but there's a heck of a lot of it under the covers doing real work for people, saving them effort. Excellent. So, so Satish, let's talk about what it was that prompted Blue Prism to pursue a partnership with Call Miner. How do they address a big front office issue that we consistently see in the industry? Yeah, no, uh, let me give a little bit of context uh, and a little background as to what, what led us to speaking with Call Miner and make, prioritizing them. So, as you know, Brad, we have been in the back office for a long time, but the biggest opportunity right now is in the front office of the contact center. So as we approached our customers to talk about automation in the contact center, obviously a lot of these customers are going through contact center transformation as they want to react and respond to their customers to personalize at scale and provide a better customer experience. And in order to do that, Blue Prism can do that more effectively if there is a nice ecosystem of contact center partners. Because the reality in the contact center is it's not a monolithical solution. It's a group of vendors that typically provide the entire solution. If you think about the core of the contact center, somebody else provides the solution. Maybe the desktop belongs to Salesforce or somebody else. And then you have call miner that is a leader 
in, in this sentiment and analytics uh, space. So clearly call miner, we, we considered as one of the partners that we really needed to engage with. And it so happened that they, they reached out to us, which was phenomenal because we, we did identify them. And one big problem we are trying to solve, especially if you put it in the COVID context is businesses are trying to solve for delivering a better customer experience, even as the traffic in their contact centers increase COVID and post COVID, right? So these agents that are trying to understand what the customer is asking for and provide that quickly without swivel chair, without trying to go to these backend systems and kind of take their attention away from that customer. We wanted to help these businesses avoid all that. And so make the agent experience better, resulting in a much more superior customer experience. End of the day, that's the problem we are trying to solve, right? Call miner can provide an ana analysis and the customer sentiment that can trigger digital workers to go get some work done. And so that's a really interesting combination, a complement mm -hmm. of things that Blue Prism with Call Miner can truly deliver a much better customer experience and, and a, a great agent experience because happier agents lead to happier customers. So that's a, a summary, I think, and that's what prompted us. And we are, we are continuing to build this ecosystem, but uh, Call Miner was among the first uh, that we picked. Great. Thank you for that. It makes a lot of sense. So Tish, are there specific verticals or industries that you think will be a better fit for the Blue Prism Call Miner tandem? Yeah. The nice thing is if you go to the Call Miner uh, website or you look at what they do, some of the industries are very common. Most of them, I would say, are very common to what Blue Prism does, right? Whether it is healthcare or financial services, you can go down that list of industries that Call Miner is in. Blue Prism, as you know, Brad, we, we have a huge presence in a number of industries. So if you look at uh, the kind of value we can provide. There are two themes that emerge and I'll ask Jeff to chime in at the right time because he and his team have been a big part of figuring out that joint value prop. And so if you, back to those two themes I was talking about, one theme is during a call, real time, I'm getting an analytics about that customer that's called in. What can I do to make that customer experience better? And automation and digital workers can play a big role in that in conjunction with what we know the customer wants real time. So that's one area, right? The second area is post-call. There is also a, a ton of things we can do. 80 to 90% of the actions the agent has to take. You, you have the analytics from the call from call miner. Mm -hmm. We know what some of the actions coming out of the call are. So we can automate some of those actions and really reduce what the agent specifically has to manually do to follow up with that customer post-call, right? So I'll, I'll uh, take those two themes. Now, if you apply it to industries, they, let's take a hospitality use case. The husband calls in because the wife is sick, wants to cancel the reservation. What is the COVID policy? So the agent is dealing with a number of different things. Can the agent delegate that work to the digital workers so that policy can be pulled up. So they're in compliance with the policy, the agent is, and the customer gets their issue resolved quickly, right? So that's one. For the post-call uh, analytics use case, if, if you think about something like um, healthcare, right? There are a number of things that uh, a, an agent would need to follow up after a call with a, a patient, let's say. Again, these digital workers can play a big role for the agent to manually delegate that work and, and get work done. Jeff, would you add anything else from your viewpoint? Yeah, I, I, I think that a lot of companies are on a journey of automation right now. And I think that the two of us together play an important role there. Back in the day when we would talk about what's the whole purpose of adding analytics to a phone system, as simple as that, and it was because there's a lot of mundane things that agents have to deal with. And if we're able to identify the mundaneity and then automate it over time, as we build up more digital workers to do some of these mundane tasks, what we find is that the worker 
gets a lot more experience and they get a lot happier because they're not dealing with, I'll change your address, turn it off and on again, that kind of thing. Rather, they're in there really being knowledge workers, skill workers, and solving people's problems. They're dealing with an insurance fraud claim and not dealing with a change of address, something like that. The ultimate goal, like I said, we're on a journey is that most of this, I will never believe it'll be all. There's always the desire for the personal touch for humans. But let's be honest with ourselves. There's going to be a high degree of automation in the contact center, which is itself a product of automation, right? If you mm -hmm. think about it, we don't take calls at our desks anymore, right? That's what a call center is for. It's industrialized. And so this idea that we're going to continue to industrialize and automate and industrialize and automate so that effectively the digital workers are handling a significant portion of this. And the customer might not even be aware of it because they're speaking, we're listening, we're coaxing responses. The digital workers are doing work and giving us data to respond to. And if it gets too much, you just slide a human in and, and the, and the worker might even say, hang on a second, I'm going to escalate you. And then bam, they're talking to a human and their experience is good because the escalation happened, not because of them per se, but because of their challenge, their issue. So I think that that's the beauty of this. We're not working to put ourselves out of a job. We're working to put that mundane agent out of a job. And I know that sounds harsh, but the reality is most of those are transitory workers anyway. And the people that want to be there want to be there and they want to deal with challenges and deal with escalations and things like that. So I think absolutely this is a great marriage of those two kinds of ecosystems. The one thing I will add is while we, we get rid of the mundane tasks that the agent has to do, we also can almost democratize the agent experience. What I mean by that is you take away some of the complexity and you don't want super agents in that sense, right? That are really good at the backend systems. They should right. be super agents in handling customers so oh, much no. and solving the problem quickly because the customers are not calling in to talk to agents. They're calling in to get their address, issue address, right? So with that in mind, you want super agents that can solve customer problems. You don't want to build super agents that are great at SAP and no offense to offense. Could not agree more. <laughs> yeah, I'm just yeah. picking uh, an example, right, of the backend systems. If every agent had to be uh, expert at every single thing system mm -hmm. that a company had, they would never be able to scale that. Uh, right. Agreed. Jeff, how has Call Miner evolved as a result of the pandemic and the movement to the cloud with the contact centers? We have been preparing for the quote unquote digital transformation wave to hit, but the result was not what I think anybody expected. I think people expected that we would automate and become more automated, much less focused on voice, much more focused on apps and chat. And when we put ourselves in a situation where we had to be digital immediately, the value of the various channels for solving different kinds of problems became evident. And we've actually seen a growth, not only in voice, but we have actually seen voice grow. We've seen other channels grow in different kind of orthogonal ways so that if like the balance check at my bank, nobody calls for that anymore, right? They, this forced them to figure that part of the system out with the app. Now that said, people will still call for mundane things because they want that human connection. They want to actually talk to another person. And so it, it, from that perspective, it just accelerated our digital adoption, if you will, strategy, but it didn't at the expense of voice and some of the other channels. This need to understand our people doing their job when I cannot put my physical eyeballs on them, which sounds gross as I say that, <laughs> <laughs> has forced us to provide a lot of behavioral feedback. Are they busy? Are they engaged? Are they constantly talking about, oh, the system's running slow, hang on. And then you go to screen capture and find out they're, they're on Instagram or they're TikToking or something You're like, no, that's no, that's not good. But it's not meant necessarily to be a big brother as much as it is, hey, how can I continue to enable these people? How can I continue to make it a good experience? And when you combine that with the great resignation of 2021, it's no joke. You want to start retaining these people because 
to your point, Satish, I'm not looking for that SAP expert. I am looking for that customer experience expert and they know who they are and they know what they're mm -hmm. worth and they're starting to demand mm -hmm. and move on. And it's not enough to get a low paying entry level job doing this. And, and right. so we're seeing a huge impact for that. And quite honestly, because of that desire to understand what people are saying in a remote setting, uh, business has been booming. Great. Satish, you have shared a few use cases, but are there any others that you want to highlight examples of how Call Miner and Blue Prism are better together? Happy to. If you think about healthcare, if there's care coordination for the patient or KYC type uh, use cases in financial services or in, in telcos, you have a storm surge or hurricane or whatever expected. How do you provide more capacity? while keeping the customer experience whole, right? So these are some of the use cases I can think of right away where we can work together to provide a much better customer experience while also enabling a better uh, agent experience in order to make that happen. It's interesting because I think once people can open up to the possibility of, hey, I have this work that I need done by call center agent. And I want to be able to trigger that in as automated a fashion as possible, but I also need to be sure that it's the right thing to do at the right time because false positives are a very bad thing in a customer service environment. Mm, yep. And so the marriage of these two, why this is better together to use your phrase is because we're focused and have put all of our time, tension, dollars, research, all of that in making sure that we're getting the right information. We just signed a, a big relationship with Microsoft so that we can use the best speech recognizer on the planet. And, and I can say that comfortable because we evaluate them all because what we have to bring to a partnership like this is we have to bring accuracy and certainty. And we need to do that in a way that gives faith that when a digital worker is kicked off, it's the right one at the right time with the right data. And so I have faith that when I hand it to a digital worker, that it's going to get done. It's going to take care of itself. I'm going to get back a result that allows the agent to be communicated to the agent or frankly, even other workers to get uh, things done. So that trust that we're both experts is the only way this works because we're starting to see some analytics companies that also claim automation on the back end. And what they mean is they've picked four or five use cases and they've automated them. and that's it. And. I don't know. I want to put my face in somebody who has thought about this more than a few hours a day. And so that's why I think these work together. This is why we have a partnership policy here. Mm. I don't want to try to go and do what Blue Prism does because you guys are really, really good at it. And, and I would rather leave that to you so that I can focus on being good at what I'm good at. Yeah. So, yeah. And as you were saying it, Jeff, I was thinking about one of the use cases we had looked at around regulatory compliance, right? You're talking about the digital worker, the trust, and the digital worker doesn't make mistakes. Once you train the digital worker to do something, the trainer might make a mistake because they have trained the digital worker to do something, which was probably not correct from a process standpoint, but it, it, the digital worker can follow every single instruction down to the word. And so yeah. when it comes to compliance, for example, regulatory compliance, you need reliability like that. You need trust like that, in, especially in a contact center, because errors can be uh, expensive, can reduce the customer satisfaction because they have to keep coming back and calling into the call center multiple times to get the same problem fixed. Yeah. And every time they're getting more angrier. So, well, and it's very, very expensive. I, I think people underestimate how expensive a phone call is, how expensive even a chat session is. And they think, oh, well, that's basically free. I've already paid for that. But the reality is if they have to call back, did you pay for that too? But you're gonna. So reducing <laughs> uh, it, those errors is huge uh, from a cost, just a pure cost yeah. perspective. A customer of ours actually said this uh, recently. They used to get hundreds of errors a day. And every single error was so expensive for them. So when we said, oh, we have reduced agent, uh, the average handle time by 80%. They said, that's great. It's profound. We, we appreciate it. And, but what is really beneficial to us as a business 
is the number of human errors that yeah. you've taken out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So absolutely. Great point. Jeff, we've talked a lot about customer experience and how call miner can help contact centers deal with customers more effectively. How does call miner also help internal functions such as marketing and, and product management? Could you touch on that? Sure. The whole idea of product experience, brand experience, market experience, those sorts of things, those come from the same set of data. If, if you think about most feedback is what's called solicited feedback. You guys probably received a survey today, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it feels like I get a survey every day, but in a 10 minute phone call or 10 minute chat or email with somebody, I typically will talk about more than just the pure, here's my question. Here's the answer. Here's the question. Here's the answer. And I, I'll give you a quick example of that, that kind of touches on both of these. Let's say I call the local carrier. We call them. And I say, Hey, I want to order the latest iPhone 13 extra pro max double camera. And they're like, oh, okay, great. And we go through the process. And at some point I go, Hey, can I get that in blood red? I really like devices I can find. Cause my, my furniture, my couch, my desk, everything's black. And I put a black phone on it and I can't find it. And the agent look, stares off into space and goes, no, it, it only comes in rose gold and silver. And they're like, oh, well, that's a bummer. And then the agent goes, well, you know, but we've, we've partnered with Otterbox, it's customers, <laughs> and, and they sell this amazing case that is absolutely the color you're looking for. Can I add that to your order? <gasps> Great. Yeah, let's do that. Now, easy example. Why does the product team care, right? They care for a couple of reasons, right? They're like, oh, okay. They asked for a feature because color is a feature that we don't have. And guess what? We're hearing red and yellow. I'm making that one up as the two most requested colors. We don't service product is definitely going to want to know that. So is marketing, mm -hmm. right? Because now the next Apple ad shows a flippy whippy phone and it's in a red case. And so they call and then marketing's like, Hey, you know, we have that, we have that, uh, uh spiff sponsorship going on with Otterbox. This is great. We're able to deal with a product defect because that's really what that is. Right. If mm -hmm. you want to think about it that way or product request through servicing the customer and keeping them happy. So you can imagine any kind of defect mention, any kind of desire, or even just saying, man, I love the fact that you guys give me rollover minutes. It bums me out. I can't use them when I go to Canada. And the agent's like, well, you can use them. If you go to Canada, you just sign up for this thing. It's that kind of interactivity with the product team effectively and with the marketing team that helps the agents in a lot of cases know what they need to do. Now, when you apply that across a digital worker, same kind of thing, because the uh, agent might not even know about the Otterbox case, right? But there's a digital worker that can go into that knowledge base and bring me back everything of relevance to the iPhone and color red. And the first thing is it goes, Hey, this is the most requested color. Here's a case, here's a case, here's a case. And you're authorized a 20% discount because they asked during a sale. Mm. And that's the kind of digital stuff that I don't want to have to try to program that in. I'd much rather have that digital worker give me that information back so that we can convey it to the agent. Well, this conversation analytics area is so fascinating. And both of you, Jeff and Satish, have really explained well how bringing Blue Prism and Call Miner together can really be a compelling solution in the contact center. So let me just thank both of you for your time today. It's been really fun talking with you about this topic and I wish you both the best. Be well. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks. Cheers, bye. Thanks for tuning in to Transform Now. For more insightful discussions on digital transformation and more, check out our podcast channel where you'll find all of our previous episodes. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a review. For more information about digital transformation and the future of work, check out blueprism.com to learn how Blue Prism's digital workforce is enabling enterprise transformation now. Thank you.